Hello, thank you for tuning into the Natural Health Rising podcast. My name is Rachel Smith. I am a certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and I've helped hundreds of people naturally reverse symptoms of autoimmune diseases and other health challenges from digestive issues to hormone imbalances. And in these weekly episodes, you're going to learn from myself and top health experts from around the world about functional medicine and holistic health tips to help you rise to your healthiest, happiest self. Welcome to today's episode where we're diving into superfoods, adaptogens, and guilt-free chocolates that can actually improve your health. My guest today is Sage Dammers, who is the co-founder and CEO of Addictive Wellness, which specializes in guilt-free raw chocolates with premium superfoods and herbs, free from sugar, dairy, gluten, soy, GMOs, and nuts, each providing unique health benefits. From his teenage years, he delved into exploring ancient herbal systems and nutritional practices, particularly focusing on Taoist tonic herbalism. As a master chocolatier and product formulator, Sage has devoted his life to this pursuit. With unyielding passion, Sage consistently seeks out the purest and most potent superfoods and adaptogenic herbs from across the globe. Today, Sage is going to provide incredible insights about adaptogens, how to use them, and which ones are great for things like supporting the immune system, energy, cognition, and sleep. Is also going to talk about examples of how you can add superfoods into your diet easily. And before we get started, I do want to share a special discount code for you that you can use at addictivewellness.com. And that code is NHR10, the number 10, NHR10 to get 10% off of any of their chocolates and adaptogen products. And I really love that their chocolates are mycotoxin free. So free of mold toxins, which we'll talk a little bit about in this episode. And not only contain super clean ingredients, but because of the healthy amount of added adaptogens, they actually make an impact on your health and have benefit. So you can find that link and the code in the show notes, and let's dive into today's show. Welcome to the show, Sage. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to chat. I am a huge uh, chocolate lover, so we'll, I'm sure we'll dive into yeah, yeah, we'll dive into uh, some details of your chocolates today. But I'd actually love to start by having you tell the listeners a little bit about your journey through studying nutrition and herbs and and doing that all over the world, actually, and what initially sparked your interest in Taoist tonic herbalism specifically. I had the good fortune to get exposed to a lot of, I suppose you could say more traditional or Eastern oriented health concepts when I was pretty young. You know, most people don't find out about these things until they're maybe in their thirties, forties, fifties and beyond, and things have already started to fall apart. And at that time, it's a little bit late to hear about the concept of, you know, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of a cure because a lot of stuff has probably already started to go wrong. I had the amazing good fortune to grow up in a family that had a lot of awareness of these things in the sense that my parents had a wellness center when I was in my teen years, where back in the early 2000s, before it was cool, they already had infrared saunas and infrared jade mm -hmm. mas massage therapy beds. And I got exposed to these ideas that if you get ahead of the game, taking care of your health, it can really set you up for a much more amazing life in many ways. And I would see these people come in, you know, I would work at the front desk when I was like, you know, 16, 17 years old. And I would see these people come in and they would have back pain. They would have kidney issues. They would have liver issues. They'd have prostate problems, you know, whatever the Lyme disease, the whole list. I, I saw people come in with it all. And a lot of them would get amazing improvements back to a state of normal health, which they were so great to return so grateful to return to. But it made me think, okay, these people got on this stuff late. And it's so helpful for them. What happens if I get on it now before anything has started to really fall apart? What could that mean in terms of my, not just my lifespan, but what's more commonly and become popularly known these days is the health span in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, my big passion in life is surfing. Maybe I don't have to stop progressing in surfing at 
35 years old and just try to hang on to whatever ability I can and then eventually spiel, you know, have to stop when I'm 60 years old. Maybe I can keep progressing well into my 80s and then live to be 100 and who knows, 120, 130, some wild numbers. And so I got into using, you know, infrared saunas into some of these different things, but I wasn't fully understanding the nutritional part yet. I grew up as a vegetarian, but not necessarily a very healthy one. Some lots of organic foods, but you could say it was lacking in nutritional density, I suppose. And then as I was working at my parents' business, this guy came in who was from the local community and he was in his mid forties. He was super smart, totally ripped in amazing shape and like just had an incredible wealth of information regarding health and nutrition. And he was just like, looked like in his forties, but look, sorry, he was in his forties, but he looked like he could be in his twenties. And mm -hmm. I thought, wow, this is exactly what I've been aiming for. I haven't had an example in front of me yet of what that would look like to get ahead of the game, taking care of your health. And this is it. Mm -hmm. I need to figure out what is this guy doing? And he had this protein powder mix that he was bringing in to see if they would carry in the business. And it was a mix of like hemp protein and spirulina and chlorella, some other Western herbs like milk thistle. And he told me he was having this two meals out of his day. And I said, okay, if that's what's working for him, I want that. Let me give this a try. And so this was kind of the launch pad for me because I started blending this up with some frozen fruit and like some Tropicana orange juice. I had no idea what I was doing and it tasted pretty rough, but <laughs> I didn't care because I wanted the results. I was so results oriented and results motivated. And pretty soon I started noticing that after I would have this drink, I would have this amazing feeling of clarity afterwards and just this amazing kind of a clear high. And I had never felt this before. And this just got me to think like, if this state is something I've never before experienced, I've been missing out on this my whole life so far, mm. what else have I been missing out on? And so I started learning more about the ingredients that were in this mix. And the more I learned about them, the more excited I got to keep going. And the, and then it's okay. I've exhausted the ingredients list of what I'm consuming now. I got to learn more because this is, surely is not the only thing out there. So then I started learning about some other superfoods like maca, for example, and lucuma and um, getting into things like acai and maki berry. But then you kind of get past that. And you, I started to learn about these more traditional herbal systems of indigenous cultures where the dosage goes down and the potency goes up as you go from a, a superfood into something with slightly more medicinal value to it, yet something that's still designed to be taken over the course of one's life on a fairly consistent basis. And the first one that really caught my attention was astragalus. And mm -hmm. this is, it's, it's a chi tonic. It's an energy tonic. It helps your moment to moment energy production. It's a great immune tonic. And I wanted to really get all the juice out of life. And my one limiting factor there was energy. I had, you know, only so much energy in every day. And I figured if I can make more energy each day, then that's another way to add more life into the time that I have on this planet. And from there, it, I, you know, I expanded my knowledge into learning more about the philosophy behind these systems. And it just was so romantic and beautiful to me that it just sucked me in. Well, that's a very amazing story and a actually quite different from a lot of people who have been on the podcast because a lot of people actually get pretty sick before they become a functional practitioner or create some company. And so amazing that you're able to like have those examples in front of you, but also you ask yourself, like, what else have I been missing out on? Which I think is something to note because I've seen people who think that they're in like decent health, but once they really start working on things or changing things up, they, they realize that they have been missing out on certain things in their life. So I'm sure today we'll get into different adaptogens and herbs and things that people can start playing around with and adding in that could possibly give them this like new level that they haven't seen before. So I'm really excited to dive into those things. But first, let's break down for the listeners what an adaptogen is, because this is one of the compounds that you use in your chocolates. And I know you guys sell adaptogens as well. Right. So the term adaptogens was actually um, coined in the mid 1900s by a Russian scientist, Dr. Nikolai Lazarev. And this was a gentleman who during the wars had been tasked with developing all kinds of performance enhancing drugs, which 
would create, of course, massive performance enhancements in the short term, but it wasn't very long before those side effects would catch up with you. Mm. After the war, when things were not so crazy, he decided to turn to what was really much more interesting to him, and that was looking for things that could create these natural performance enhancements, but that were natural instead of synthetic and harmful in the long run. He wanted to find things that could naturally improve performance and build health on all levels. And he had, of course, earlier been researching ginseng as a part of what they were looking into in Russia from earlier wars with the Chinese. They found that the Chinese were soldiers were powered heavily by ginseng and able to have incredible endurance because of the ginseng that they were consuming. And he was tasked with others with finding something like this in Russia. And they don't have ginseng commonly growing in Russia, but what they do have is eleuthero, which has now come to be known as Siberian ginseng because it shares so many of its properties with ginseng, even though they're not close relatives, botanically speaking. But of course, adaptogens were around much longer than this. You look back at the traditional systems coming from Ayurveda and Taoist tonic herbalism and Chinese traditional herbalism, and these go back thousands of years. So while this guy got the credit for the term adaptogens, it's nothing new. And the idea with an adaptogen is it's an herb that's strengthening your resilience and strengthening your body's own self-correcting, self-balancing mechanisms. Your body is very wonderfully designed, but sometimes it needs support in certain ways that the modern diet doesn't necessarily give it. And with these herbs, you're able to allow your body to adapt to stressors of all sorts, whether it be something like the stress of you know emotional stress and, and work stress in daily life, or whether you're talking about the stress of a relationship or physical stressors like working out and how fast you can recover after working out and the kind of endurance that you're going to have, or whether it's um, immune stress, whether uh, you have an overactive or an underactive immune system and you need to bring things more into balance there. So adaptogens, each one has its own specialties. And so people we hear about a lot of them in the in our talk today and may get overwhelmed thinking, that, geez, that's so many, I don't know where to start. You can pick almost any one. Here, the one that we mentioned that sounds the most exciting to you based on where you're at as a person. And I would say start there. And then you can slowly add in one here and one there and expand. You don't have to start taking every adaptogen in the world all on day one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's let's break that down just a little bit then, like knowing where to start. And we can, we can go into a few different categories. Um, a lot of people that I work with have autoimmune diseases, for example. And so I'm sure a lot of people listening may have an autoimmune disease or something similar. Where should someone start in that realm if they're trying to support their immune system more? Of course, always do this under the guidance of a functional medicine practitioner so that your condition can be monitored. Because while certain herbs may work in a certain way for the vast majority of the population, 100% of the people are not going to react the exact same way to 100% of these herbs. Everybody has this bio individuality. We all have unique genetics. As an example, rhodiola is an amazing herb that for, for physical and mental energy that's so great for a lot of people. I can't do it because I have a certain gene that would make me uh, long-term run uh, psychological risks if I was using rhodiola all the time. So definitely always have somebody helping to guide you through all of this and to monitor, especially if you have something like an autoimmune condition. That said, the area of medicinal mushrooms is the subclass of adaptogens that I would look to first. Here, we're looking at things not like uh, ground mushrooms, like portobello mushrooms and button mushrooms that you might have on your pizza, uh, although you probably shouldn't be having the pizza, especially if you're dealing with just, you know real autoimmune issues or just want to be healthy in general. However, we're looking at things like reishi mushroom and chaga mushroom and cordyceps fungus and agaricus and turkey teal mushroom. These have these long chain sugars in them called beta-glucan polysaccharides. And these are sugars that are actually bitter in flavor and they're long chain. They're up to three feet long, wrapped up into these tiny balls and they come into your body and they improve the intelligence of your immune system. It's like an operating system upgrade for your immune system. And these have a very balancing effect and they're um, very frequently shown in research to not just stimulate the immune system blindly, we're not pushing just in one direction here, but to bring it into more of a state of balance where if it's overactive and it actually help to wind it back a little bit. And if it's underactive, it can help give you all the tools and weaponry you need to go after the real bad guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about energy. I'm super curious with the rhodiola. How did you know about 
the genetic issue for yourself? I had my genetics first tested about 10 years ago. And one of the defining genes that I have, and I was blown away at how much this one gene explains so much of my life, my personality, my way of interacting with reality. And it's a gene called the homozygous positive COMT gene. And what this does is I make um, catecholamine neurotransmitters like a normal person. So I make a normal amount of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. And the problem is I don't get rid of them as fast as a normal person would. So my production line is normal, but the shipping out of these, getting them out of my body doesn't happen as fast. And so it's possible that when these build up too high, it can cause problems. It has its upside. So I have really good focus. I can learn things really fast. I am generally very happy because I've got all that dopamine flowing in my system. But when these build up too high, they can actually become irritants to the nervous system. So things that either spike my production of these, like caffeine, or on the other hand, things that impede my ability to detoxify these. Uh, and rhodiola has a little bit of a role in, in both of those categories can will in the short term make me feel amazing like i have rhodiola or caffeine i am for about one day on top of the world but then i have a big crash for about a week afterwards because it's too much for the nervous system mm. so it's because of that gene that i have to be careful with an herb like rhodiola i'll never forget my first rhodiola experience and it was before i knew about my genes and i was like Holy moly is like um, in, in that movie Limitless where just like everything is turning on. I could not believe it, but I got to be careful long-term because not only do I get a bit bummed out afterwards for a few days, but long-term it can heighten risk of things like schizophrenia and bipolar, mm. which I definitely don't want to get involved with. Yeah, definitely not. That's that's uh, such good inf information to know about yourself. Are there any adaptogens or herbs that are Obviously, everybody's bio-individual, but something that would be more gentle for energy. Yeah. So the one I mentioned earlier, astragalus, is one of my favorite gentle energy tonics. And this is one that is improving both energy production throughout the body, and it's also improving what in the traditional Chinese system was called the Wei Qi, which is they described as like a surface-level subcutaneous energy that runs all over your body. It's basically like the front line of your immune system. And this was a traditional favorite herb of people in China who had to do really hard labor in the outdoors, in the elements, in the cold. And it would help with that internal fire and the physical energy, especially in the extremities, they would say, and especially strengthening the arms and the legs. And this is one that it's not going to overstimulate you. You could drink an astragalus tea in the evening and 99% of people anyways would be just fine going to bed right after. It's not a stimulant. It's not saying to your body, we're in an emergency, let's release adrenaline. It's just strengthening your body's own energy production mechanisms, which is what happens in your mitochondria where you're making ATP. So when you look at a lot of these chi tonics, if we look at these in more modern scientific terms, they're supporting mitochondrial health, which is where your body makes its potential energy. Just because you have that energy doesn't mean you have to use it right away. It's mm -hmm. like money in your checking account. It's mm -hmm. there for you to use when you need it, but you're not forced to spend it immediately. Whereas when you have, say, coffee, for example, in moderation, it has certainly benefits, but in excess, it's like giving somebody a bunch of uh, like gift cards that expire at the end of today, and you're forced to pay for them right now, and they're going to expire. And if you don't use them, they're gone, and you're just going to you know go crazy. So it's it's just, uh, it's a I think the best way to describe it is it's a a but energy potentiator, or it's enhancing your potential energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when it comes to dosages, um, amounts for these things, I'm, I'm sure there's many differences and nuances, but with, let's just take your chocolates, for example, there's some adaptogens in there. Is there enough in those chocolates to make a difference? Like, do, do you need to be eating chocolates all day long? Is this a good excuse for us to start eating lots of chocolates or yeah. is it also, <laughs> okay. No, no, I, I mean, not, me not necessarily, boxes. yes. Not, not saying you have to eat 20 bars in one day. I, I just, I just, just, <laughs> um, or, or is it better to like supplement with some on top of that? Explain that the, maybe the dosage of gen generalize it a little bit of how that works. Yeah. So in formulating the chocolates, in theory, if I was a, a selfish, purely financially oriented person looking at short-term gains, I could put very tiny dosages of these things in there 
put the name on the ingredient list, use that to sell the chocolate, tell you this great story about the herbs. But the problem is that you're not going to have an experience with it in the sense that you'll eat it, you won't feel anything, and you won't come back. And that's not a great sustainable business model in the long term for a consumable products business. So the key thing for me is that I want people to have an experience where they feel it in their body because I can tell people stories about these herbs all day long. Nothing is going to compare to the experience when they feel it in their body. Like I felt it with those smoothies back in my early days, or I felt it the first time I had rhodiola or astragalus. So I want it to be a deeply embodied experience for each individual. So definitely we're putting a similar amount to what you would get in a supplemental herbal formulation, taking a couple of capsules. And it's uh, going to be different, of course, the perfect amount for each individual because people have different body masses. People have different metabolisms. People are taking out an empty stomach or on a full stomach. Um, people have different levels of, of natural hydrochloric acid and digestive enzyme production. So they're getting more or less out of it. There's an a endless list of different factors that can affect the perfect dosage for somebody. So ultimately, even if you're working, let's say herbs aside, let's say you're working with a more mainstream doctor on a prescription medication. Even they don't know 100% of the time what the perfect dosage is for you. They might try you on a certain dose and then the, you might report how you're doing and they say, okay, let's try a higher dose or let's try a lower dose. It's going to be the exact same with adaptogens and tonic herbs. The, the right dose is going to be slightly different across the population, but we've tried to find that perfect dose there where for the majority of people, it will be an awesome experience. Okay. So speaking of medications, since there's enough in these chocolates to have an experience, is there anything that people need to be careful with? Like, should they actually ask their doctor before they eat these chocolates? Um, can you eat too many of the chocolates? Tell me a little bit more about maybe possible safety precautions there. Sure. Anything can be overdosed on. You could overdose on water as safe as that mm -hmm. is. You could drink 10 gallons a day of water and probably you're not going to feel great. You're going to be spending most of your life in the bathroom anyways. And with these chocolates, so um, there are contraindications for certain herbs, certainly. And for example, let's say somebody was taking Coumadin and they wanted to have one of our chocolates that had ashwagandha in it. There's a contraindication there. So it's good to speak with a doctor at the very least, check what's in the foods that you're consuming if you're taking prescription medications. And you can do a, you know 10, 15 minutes of online research at the very least just to make sure nothing is a contraindication there because that can be true even through normal dietary or, or supplement consumption that there can be contraindications with the prescription medication. So if somebody's on a medication, you always have to be extra careful around anything that you're going to consume. Absolutely. Uh, great examples like grapefruit. Like grapefruit's contraindicated with so many medications or, you know, from blood thinners, like too much ginger or too much turmeric or fish oil or these things too. So right. um, definitely quick research on that is always important. So is there anything um, for people to note about quality of adaptogens sourcing, anything to be careful with, you know, are there heavy metals in, in herbs that we need to be careful about? 100%. As with anything in the world, there's going to be various levels of quality out there. And what you have to look for varies a little bit from one adapted into the next. And that's kind of where we've come in with the expertise and really done the hard work to procure the very best for you. But of course, heavy metals are something to always think about with anything that we consume these days. And getting absolute zero in just about any product that's not grown in a laboratory, which you probably don't want anyways, for other reasons, is not going to be possible. It's just the reality of the world that we live in. You now you could, you could go ultra religious about it and try to avoid all heavy metals, but you're not going to have much left to consume. That said, you want to, of course, minimize the heavy metals. And so that's been something super important to us from day one is testing the heavy metal levels with third-party laboratories of everything that we sell and everything that's used in our chocolates, et cetera. So that's one. And then you also want to look at how and where it's grown. The Dow has had this philosophy called D-Dow. And this basically says that whatever herb you're looking at, you want to try to find out where it evolved in, like what environment it evolved in, what region it evolved in, and get it grown in that area if possible. Because whatever place it evolved in is where it evolved to grow the strongest. It evolved to thrive on 
the weather conditions in the area, the minerals that are found in that particular soil, the fluctuations in temperature there between day and night. And so we search for getting these herbs in the places that they were traditionally wild grown and then cultivated. And this goes also into mushrooms, especially because there's a lot of different formats to get mushrooms in these days. You can buy a mushroom product, whether it's reishi or chaga, turkey tail, et cetera, that is USDA certified organic grown in the USA. And that all sounds very positive. The problem that happens with a lot of these is that when they've been laboratory analyzed, they don't contain hardly any actual mushroom material. What's in these is grain. And the problem is that when they grow them, they take a base of grain, could be oat, could be brown rice. Um, they use various different ones, but they in basically put the, the fungi into this grain. And in the ideal world, the fungi eats up all the grain material. And what you're left with at the end is mushroom mycelium that contains not all, but a good amount of the beneficial compounds that we're looking for in these mushrooms. The problem is they, they rush it, they don't do it right. And so when they analyze it at the end, there's little to no actual mushroom material left in there. Yet these are being sold as products claiming to be those mushrooms. So you're basically paying a very high price for powdered brown rice. The other way of doing it is the way that they're designed to grow in nature, the way these mushrooms have evolved. They didn't evolve growing on brown rice. They evolved growing on wood. So you want to get these mushrooms grown on a wood base because that is their natural food. That's the food they evolved to thrive on. If I took anybody listening to this and I put them from their ancestral diet onto a diet of 100% grain, they wouldn't be the fullest manifestation of themselves either. So when we deal with a wood-grown mushroom, not only do you end up with real mushroom as the final product, but what you end up with is a mushroom that produces different compounds than if it's grown on grain. Because when you grow mushrooms on grain, because it's not their proper food, you produce the immune-enhancing beta-glucans that we're talking about before, but there's a whole other class of beneficial compounds called terpenes that you aren't producing hardly any of when it's growing on grain. Whereas when it's grown on wood, you've got these there. And then you also want to look at how is the mushroom or the herb being processed afterwards? Because some herbs you can get that are just ground up into a raw powder. It's called a crude powder in the industry. And it's not concentrated. In many cases, it's not going to be as bioavailable as you would want it to be. And this is especially true with mushrooms because these often have a hard woody texture to them, especially something like reishi. And so you could eat it just as you could eat a piece of wood if you really went to work on it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be fun and you're not going to really absorb anything out of it. It's not going to do much for you, if anything at all, because in reishi and in other medicinal mushrooms, you have the cell walls made from this very hard substance called chitin. This is one of the hardest substances in nature and your digestion can't break through it. So mm -hmm. at the very least, you want a mushroom that's been hot water extracted where it's been taken up to a high temperature to crack through that wall and get the good stuff out from inside. We actually go with our reishi two steps further. Actually, the first step is that they collect the spores because those contain the same kind of beneficial compounds as are in reishi mushroom, but at even higher levels. And those undergo high pressure cell wall cracking to get into the goodies in there. And then we take the water extract of the reishi mushroom and the alcohol extract, because you get different beneficial compounds that are either alcohol soluble or water soluble. Mm -hmm. And then those are combined to make a tincture. And then that goes through spray drying to turn it into a powder. So you're not paying the extra cost of having to ship liquid around. You can get it in a more uh, potent form that way and get more for your money. And then you add the spores back into it. So you really get like a three in one, all the best that Reishi has to offer. Mm, that's so good. So if somebody, I mean, of course we want people to go check out your products, but if someone's just at the store, like the health food store, and they're reading a bottle of, of reishi or a package, um, is there wording that's always going to be on the bottle that helps them differentiate like, oh, I should get this one versus this one. Um, maybe it says fruiting bodies, or does it say grown on wild, you know, in the wild, or what does that look like? Yes. So uh, the fruiting body term can sometimes show up also on the grain grown. So mm. most of the time, if it's wood grown, any smart company who wants to make the money back for all the effort they just put into doing the right thing and growing it on wood is going to tell you that, at least somewhere on the packaging. They're going to say wood-grown mushroom. If you see the term mycelium, 
that's usually an indicator that it's grain grown. And often on these grain grown products, they will at least have a section where it says other ingredients and it will list whatever grain it was grown on. That way they're kind of getting themselves out of any legal issues because they can't get sued because they didn't tell you there was grain in there. Mm -hmm. So careful with those. Yeah. Cause somebody could, could have some sort of allergy or something. And with, again, with my clients with autoimmune diseases, we take them off of grains for a little bit. And some people, some people just don't do well with grains, especially yeah. with autoimmune diseases. And so even with these products that you have to be careful looking out for those things. And I try and uh, steer clear of those products myself for my clients. So let's get into superfoods. Um, what, what role do you see? I mean, we heard a little bit of your story, but what role do some popular superfoods play in holistic health? We live in an interesting era now where we have so much available to us in terms of some of the best foods from around the world that you can have access to. We have access to all these different herbal extracts that even 20 or 30 years ago, you didn't really have any access to, especially in the US. And then we also have the other part of our reality, which is that our soils are very mineral depleted. It's a, you could look at the studies looking at you know, a tomato and the amount of minerals that you find in it today versus in the early 1900s, for example, and it's a totally different world. So I see superfoods as a great way to pull in extra nutrition as a form of a almost a food-based supplement to a diet that even despite our best efforts may be a little deficient just because of the soils that we're growing it in. And this doesn't replace entirely supplementation, but I always say do the best you can from a nutritional basis then look at your blood work, see what you need to take things a step further in a positive direction, and then turn to supplements. They have certainly their place. So with superfoods, you look at things that don't have quite the medicinal value of tonic herbs, for example, or um, the, the potency of those, but are still on a whole different level than what you would find in typical foods. So we're talking, of course, about my favorite here is going to be cacao and chocolate, but there's, of course, others, things like... Um, hemp seeds or acai, lucuma, maki berries, um, camu camu coming from South America is the second highest vitamin C source in the world, mm -hmm. only after the Australian cacatoo plum. And you find different ones in, in different areas of the world. Of course, it seems that a lot of them come from more exotic places a lot of the time. You know, you could look at things from Polynesia, like noni fruit, for example, which is one of the worst tasting things in the entire world, but it's so nutrient dense and beneficial, or you could look at even durian coming from Southeast Asia as a very high fat fruit that is really unique in that way and very nutrient dense and very polarizing in its flavor again, but people who love it really love it. And then we also look at, um, I would say that this other class, it's like the superfood sidekicks, things like mesquite and lucuma, for example, coming also from South America that aren't quite at the nutritional density level of what I would consider the slightly higher class of superfoods, but they are very complementary in their flavors. They have much higher nutritional density than a lot of things you would come across in your average health food store. And they can be a cool part of a well-rounded modern diet that is bringing in nutritional density to supplement what we may be missing. Mm -hmm. Can we get, I mean, I know we can get cacao, hemp seeds, acai. We can get those things in the U.S. Can we get the other things, the the Australian cockatoo plums and the mesquite. That one, I don't <laughs> think anybody's importing right now. You can, there's companies that sell it in Australia. And I had the good fortune when I was uh, living there for a year to in taking as much of it as I possibly could, because I knew I wouldn't have it forever. Mm -hmm. And I definitely brought some home with me, but it didn't last too long. So some of these we don't have access to, and that is something that can inspire your travels. If you want to go, if you're traveling somewhere, find out what are the most nutrient dense things that naturally grow there and see if you can find an opportunity to maybe visit a farm or go on a, a wild food walk with a local guide. These are some, it's, it's something that you could do more and more now in places everywhere to connect with somebody in a local area who will take you out into nature and show you things that you can actually just harvest with your hands and experience. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's always a fun part. Two, two things I love to do when traveling anywhere is try to find wild spring water. Let me say three, try to find wild spring water, get into the coldest water I can find in that location with my whole body and also experience the most nutrient dense foods that are coming from that place. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. I'm going to, um, I'm in Columbia right now, so I'll have to explore some of those things. Oh, I'm sure there's a, a whole plethora of things waiting for you to experience there. Yeah. So when it comes to, and let's uh, maybe use us as a, a basis for some of these things that people can incorporate, but what are some ways to incorporate superfoods and make food to enhance focus and cognition? So I would say you can try to add them into what you're already eating, figure out ways that you can make the flavors work. So for example, uh, if you're making a salad, get some moringa leaf powder mm. and take a teaspoon of that, sprinkle it over your salad. The flavor camouflages in real nice. And you won't even know it's there yet. You've added a whole level of nutrition to your salad that wasn't there before. Or uh, to share with you what I love making for breakfast every single day is that I take an avocado and I put in there also a tablespoon of grass-fed ghee, a tablespoon of MCT oil, a tablespoon of almond butter, and then I do um, some pea protein and a tablespoon of spirulina and chlorella. And I mash this all up like it's a guacamole type of texture. And then there's this really great gluten-free bread from Northern California that I like to get. Um, they're called Grindstone Bakery. And whereas most gluten-free products have all these uh, high glycemic starches like potato starch and corn starch in it, which, mm -hmm. is, which will just skyrocket your blood sugar and are probably worse than the actual gluten for most people. This is all seed-based. So it's a very clean recipe that I've even had a, a continuous glucose monitor on for a while. And my blood sugar was just flat when I would eat this would not change at all. So that was a you know good test for me. And so I'll put this guacamole superfood mix on top of four toasted pieces of this bread. And I'll put up some mixed spices and, and salt on top. And that is a meal that will carry me for like seven to eight hours usually before I even think about eating again. Mm -hmm. And so that's a way that I like to incorporate chlorella and spirulina as two great algae based superfoods every single day. And then of course, chocolate is something that requires very little explanation. Most people know what to do with that one, assuming it's a, a very high quality dark chocolate, ideally with a mycotoxin free cacao. So you're not going to be feeding a lot of issues that you may be dealing with in terms of mold sensitivity and mycotoxin sensitivity. And even if you're not mycotoxin sensitive, then you're still in a situation where you're, you're not going to be benefited by it. Everyone could, could be better off if you don't have mycotoxins in the body. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I wanted to ask you about that specifically. Um, we've talked about mold on this podcast multiple times and I don't think people are aware of what foods may have higher amounts of mold toxins in them. Can you share a little bit more about the presence of that in cacao? Yeah. So when we talk about mycotoxins, these are essentially the metabolic byproduct, AKA poop of mold. And so it's not so much the mold that comes into your body. That's the problem. Although it certainly is, it's mostly the byproducts of it. Like you see this, I'm sure with uh, Lyme disease as well. It's not just the spirochetes, for example, that are causing issues. It's their metabolic byproducts that are so toxic. So with the mold and the mycotoxins, you see various levels of this in different foods. Grains are of course, a huge problematic source of this. Another problematic source is cacao and chocolate. Fortunately, we've managed to create a cacao that is completely mycotoxin free, which is pretty unique. And different people have different levels of sensitivity to this in part based on their genetics, in part based on their past mold exposure, whether dietary, or maybe you grew up in a moldy home where you're living in a moldy home now, and that tends to make people a lot more sensitive to these things, but there's nobody for whom mycotoxins are beneficial. So cutting them down is, is always going to be a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, so what else are go-to foods for, let's say, increasing energy throughout the day? And then do you have anything for improving sleep at night for food-wise? Absolutely. So first going through the day food-wise, I would make sure that you're getting a good amount of healthy fats in there because this can function as an alternative energy source. And I mentioned the MCT oil that I like to put in my breakfast. I actually use a specific kind of MCT called C8 because you can have C8 and C10 in most MCT oils. C8 tends to cause less digest digestive disturbance and is more easily converted into energy that the body can use. So that's a great slow burning energy source. When you have fats to burn as an energy source, 
it's different than burning carbs and sugar in the sense that if you're running on energy sources of, of carbs and sugar, it's kind of like taking a bunch of uh, newspaper or kindling and putting it on your fire. Flares up real big, real fast. But you know, five, 10 minutes later, you don't have much left. Whereas if you're if you're adapting your metabolism to run also on healthy fats, this is like taking a big log and putting it on the fire. It's going to take a little bit to get it going and get it burning, but this can burn consistently for many hours and provide you very steady energy. Mm -hmm. And then in the adaptogen world, you know, we mentioned astragalus. I also want to mention another one of my favorite energy tonics, which is cordyceps. And this is a fungi which increases your oxygen utilization. And so from the oxygen that you're breathing, more is actually making it to your blood, to your muscles, to your brain, and it's helping cognitive function as well. And it's also helping with your immune system. And this is one of my absolute favorites just all around. And this got actually really famous a couple of decades ago because uh, Chinese athletes, runners, females especially, were outperforming everybody else and nobody could figure out like, what are they doing? Everyone thought, oh, they must be doping. It turned out they were just taking cordyceps. And so for people who are physically active, this is an amazing herb. It really gives you an extra level to, to push into, an extra, like, you know, for people who are automotively oriented, it feels like it gives you about 10% more horsepower mm -hmm. that uh, you just wasn't there before. And it's really benefiting the mitochondria as well. So helping with that ATP cellular energy production. Mm -hmm. And then to your question about sleep, Sleep preparing, preparing for sleep really starts at the beginning of the day, I would say. It starts with making sure that you're exposed to sunlight in the morning because that helps to set your circadian rhythm. Because when you're exposed to bright light, especially sunlight, it tells your body, okay, this is daytime. We're going to shut down melatonin production, but we're going to start a timer that's going to go off in about 16 hours, give or take, when that melatonin is going to start flowing again and you're going to start feeling sleepy. So you start with that and then as you go through the day, you want to think about when you're going to stop stimulants like caffeine. I would say two o'clock for most people on average is a good cutoff there. There's going to be some variance because there's different genes in terms of how fast or slow people metabolize caffeine. That's why you see some people can have caffeine pretty late in the evening and it doesn't disturb their sleep too much at all. Other people, they can have a cup of coffee at 11 in the morning and, and they can't sleep that night because they're just really slowly getting that caffeine out of their system. So Try to stop caffeine as early as possible so it's not lingering in your system because the way caffeine works is you have these adenosine receptors in your brain, and it's like a game of musical chairs. When you get the adenosine receptors filled up, this creates what's called sleep pressure. It makes you feel tired. It makes it easy to go to sleep. Caffeine also sits in those seats of the adenosine receptors, and so if caffeine's in the seat, adenosine can't get into the seat, and that creates a problem because you're not able to build up that sleep pressure and go to sleep until the caffeine wears off and gets out of there. So that's a big one. And then as you go into the evening, think about avoiding blue light, of course, uh, because it was while that was good for you in the morning, now it's not good for you anymore. And so you can go in the settings on your iPhone, for example, and make it so that at night, it only shows red and black light. And that is a great way to make it easy to use your devices at night. Still, you can still text or do whatever you need to do and stay functional, but not get that blue light exposure because the blue light is going to suppress your melatonin production at the wrong time of day. Then in the food department, two things that can be really good here. One is having a couple of kiwis just before going to bed or about half an hour before going to bed. This is actually shown in a study to improve total sleep duration and improve sleep efficiency. So the sleep efficiency is the percentage of time that you spend in bed that you're actually asleep. Because just because you're lying there rolling around doesn't mean <laughs> that you're actually getting the proper rest and the deep sleep and the REM sleep that you're really looking for. So that can be a surprising trick. And it's so innocent and, and commonplace. What, two Kiwis that people often like don't even give it a try because it sounds too easy. But when people try it, they're actually kind of blown away. Like, wow, that really worked. And it may be because of some neurotransmitters also found in Kiwis that are having an interesting role in there. And then for people who struggle with uh, some some blood sugar imbalances during the nighttime that can tend to wake you up around three or four if your blood sugar is getting too low and your body secretes some adrenaline to keep you going, but then that wakes you up and you can't fall back asleep. Having a teaspoon of honey 30 minutes before going to bed can also remarkably just really help to keep blood sugar balanced during the night and keep you from waking up. It's another one, one of those ones that seems so easy and simple that people don't try it, but when they do, they're blown away. 
And then in the adaptogen category, of course, is one of the most exciting for me. Reishi mushroom, which we briefly mentioned earlier, is amazing for stress and anxiety and just calming you down and making you feel more centered, slowing down all the thoughts going in the brain and just getting you kind of out of thinking and into feeling. In fact, the Taoists would say that it is like enlightenment GPS. It helps guide you around the obstacles standing in between you and enlightenment. It's like, a, it's a very spiritual herb that until you've taken it for a while, it sounds kind of crazy, but it, it works on, on some pretty deep levels. And then you also have things like ashwagandha. Those are kind of my go-to reishi and ashwagandha together as my evening drink that helps ensure a really good night of sleep. And with those, I like to take a couple of capsules of magnesium L3 and 8, which is a relatively unique form of magnesium in its great ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, actually raising brain levels of magnesium. And magnesium glycinate is also a great one to take. It's very calming because of the glycine that the magnesium is bound to there. And the glycine also helps to lower the core body temperature in the night, which improves your quality of sleep. So many amazing tips for people to dive into. Thank you so much yeah, for they, that. Of course. And they don't have to do them all at once. You could, if you want to really go wild, don't let me discourage you, but you could just start <laughs> on one, see how it goes. Then maybe next week you try another one and then maybe you're combining two and having just a fantastic night of sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More likely to to know what's working. More likely to stick to it as well. Maybe you want to track. I, I wear an aura ring. So like if I change anything... Yep in my evening or, or day. Um, I like to see how that reflects on my actual sleep data as well. So you can play Absolutely. around with that. Yeah, my, I, I do as well. Mine's charging right now because it's running on low on battery this morning, but yeah, I'm a huge fan. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, well, this has been wonderful. Are you open to doing like a quick speed round? That's not necessarily health related. Let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> Um, what is your favorite thing to do for stress reduction? Surfing and, and taking reishi mushroom and doing deep breathing and getting into cold water. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, if I had to do one, if I had to do one, um, surfing. Okay. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? I would say a superpower of communication to always be able to transmit to people the, the the purity of what I really want to say, because so much can be lost mm -hmm. through the, the clunkiness of, of language and words. And so, especially if I could do it in, in any language and transcend language barriers, I love learning languages. It's another one of my big passions, but if there was a superpower that I could just um, psychologically tap into somebody and let them know what I really mean in my heart, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. If you could take one supplement for the rest of your life, not nothing else, what would you take? Reishi mushroom. Okay. Everybody's run into the store to buy reishi after this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you could travel anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? I'm really curious to go to the Portuguese island of Madeira. Mm. I've been... It's one that I've been looking into for a bit, and it's really en enticing me. It seems that it's the, the surfing there is amazing, but just the nature looks extraordinary. So that's one I'm I'm keen to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Azor Azores looks amazing yeah. and looks very like out of this world, like a yeah, some sort of Avatar movie or something. <laughs> Absolutely, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. And last question, if you could leave the listeners with one tip that they could implement this week to help them live a healthier, happier life, what would that be? May seem cliche to say try adaptogens, so I will skip that one. And instead, I will say try to spend some time sitting still and listening to your body. Because when it comes to figuring out what's right for you and what the right dosage is for you, what the right thing to take is for you, it really helps to cultivate body awareness. And this can be done through meditation. It can be done through yoga, through yoga nidra, or just kind of, you know, Eckhart Tolle says, focus on the inner energy system in your body and try to feel things happening inside of you. Because through being able to pay attention to how you're feeling and what's going on inside, in a world where we're so distracted by the outside, you know, people don't spend two minutes of, of stillness without pulling up their phone to start scrolling again. If you can get that inner focus going on, 
you'll be able to more quickly figure out what's really working for you, how this herb is making you feel, how that supplement is affecting you. How did you do on this dose? Could you maybe do with more? Could you maybe do with less? And so I think that is a, a super tool that can help people in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the idea of, of the mindfulness and the stillness paired with the going slow with every, with trying everything, right? Because if you add in three different adaptogens and magnesium L3 and eight and all these things before you go to sleep and you're like, did it work what for me? Yeah. Did I have a something reaction? in there work, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to stop sure. taking any of them now because <laughs> I don't know what did it. I don't want to stop. <laughs> yeah. But okay. I would say also, if I, if I could just add one more quick thing, my advice, if you're taking a new adaptogen for the first time is to take it, as you said, on its own. And I would say, sit somewhere in stillness and silence and take, let's say you're using an adaptogen extract powder where the recommended first dose is a half teaspoon. Just take a couple ounces of warm water, stir in that powder with it. So it's like you're drinking a tea, slowly sip on that, sit still for a while, focus on your breath, focus on how things are feeling inside of you. Because sometimes people try to take so many ingredients and take them all at once, as you mentioned. And it's like going on a first date with somebody. If you wanted to have a, a first date that would lead to the ideal long-term relationship, you wouldn't take that first date to a rave because mm. you're not going to get to know them one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to see some wild dance moves and it's going to be a lot of fun. But what do you really know about them at the end of the night? You can do all that stuff later in the relationship. Absolutely. Once you get to know that person or that herb, you can create all kinds of wonderful realities together. But initially, you want to go somewhere intimate, somewhere quiet, somewhere one-on-one -on -one that you can really get that one-on-one -on -one connection and knowledge. Because once you have that feeling of how it's affecting your body, that's knowledge that you're never going to lose. That's something you carry forward as a tool that you can use to optimize your own health for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful analogy. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Share where people can find you, where they can reach out to you, and just any other last things you want to share with the listeners. Sure. So you can find us on our website, addictivewellness.com. We've got lots of goodies we'd love for you to experience, whether it's uh, our sugar-free chocolates infused with different adaptogenic herbs and different formulations. We have elixir blends if you like to recreate some of your favorite delicious hot drinks in a way that is actually super good for you. Or we have these adaptogens individually. And I would love for you to experience one of those and for me to be able to share my passion with you in that way as well. And if this educational info is something that you enjoyed, we also have a YouTube channel where we're posting a couple of times a week as much educational content as possible in the world of nutrition, health optimization, supplements, adaptogens, and all of it. And if you would like to try any of our products, uh, please use the code NHR10 for 10% off on your order. And I hope that you guys uh, will enjoy everything that we put so much passion into. Wonderful. We'll put all the links and the, the discount code and everything in the show notes. So thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to like this video and comment, letting me know what you enjoyed and what you want to see more of. Also, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get alerts when new content is coming out and you don't miss any videos. And just a quick reminder that this information is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Please consult with a qualified healthcare professional before making any changes to your diet, exercise routine, supplements, or medical treatment. If you're looking for a functional medicine practitioner, please reach out to me. And thank you again for watching and keep striving to become your healthiest, happiest self.